Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation. As Director of Lectures and Seminars, it's my privilege to welcome everyone to our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium, uh, to welcome those who are joining us on the Heritage website, and to make that last courtesy request that everyone in-house check that cell phones have been turned off. Our speakers and those recording the festivities will be most grateful. Uh, we will post the program within 24 hours on our website for everyone's future reference. Hosting and introducing our special guest this morning is David Addington. Mr. Addington is Vice President for Domestic and Economic Policy here at Heritage. David? Good morning, and thank you for joining us at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, the mission of the Heritage Foundation is to formulate and promote conservative public policies based on five principles, free enterprise, limited government, individual freedom, traditional American values, and a strong national defense. One of the biggest challenges facing Congress is what to do about our broken tax code. In our discussions with the public and interested members of Congress, Heritage encourages low-tax, globally competitive, pro-growth policies. Today we welcome to Heritage two U.S. Senators to present ideas for tackling the tax challenge. We look forward to hearing about their plan to encourage private sector investment and job creation here at home and a more competitive America in markets abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Senators Ron Wyden of Oregon and Dan Coates of Indiana. Should I just sail forth here, Dave? Yes, sir. All right. Dave, thank you very much, and, and big thanks to Heritage for putting on this program. My sense is, and I'm sure Dan would uh, agree with us, that the first rule in the United States Senate ought to be to never filibuster allies in a cause. And nobody has been more helpful to us on this issue than Heritage when the Center for Data Analysis did their assessment of this legislation earlier when Senator Gregg and I uh, put it in together. The fact that you all found that the deficit would be an average of $61 billion lower per year. We would create 2.3 million, million jobs per year. On average, we would have a more favorable debt to GDP ratio. You all gave us a big, big send-off. So in light of that, I'm going to keep uh, the filibusters off the agenda. And just want to make a couple of, of big, uh, big points with respect to, to our issue. First, I have had the good fortune of working with two United States senators on this who are as market-oriented and growth-focused as anyone that I've served with in public service. So to Dan Coates, Jim Carter is here who did yeoman work for Senator Gregg when we worked on this for the better part of two years, week after week after week, we could not be in the position we are today without them. And that makes this the first bipartisan effort to reform tax law in a quarter century. In other words, there has not been Democrats and Republicans together on tax reform since 1986. And I think it's particularly appropriate that we have this program now because this week in Washington is primarily about partisanship and cutting. And Senator Coates and I are here to talk about bipartisanship and growing. And let me just kind of outline a couple of quick points and then turn it over to my friend Senator Coates. The first point is our legislation is, has been, and always will be a jobs bill. When we look back at 1986, the single most important focus in the two years after we had tax reform in 1986, our country created 6.3 million new non-farm jobs. That growth spurt very much tracks what Heritage found in their analysis of our legislation is we would create, according to their assessment, at the Center for Data Analysis, more than 2.3 million new jobs per year. So first and foremost, this is a jobs bill. Second, uh, as Americans wade through the 6 billion hours that they are 
wrapping up on tax preparation at a cost of $160 billion. It comes to more than 600,000 years if you break it out. Senator Coates and I would like to tell America that as far as tax preparation is concerned, we want to give them their springtime back. The typical return could be filled out in under an hour under our bipartisan legislation. So this is about growth and it's uh, about uh, uh, simplicity. The third point I want to make is philosophically what we're trying to do with this tax approach is give everybody in America, everybody, the opportunity to get ahead. And what that means is if you don't have much, you're just starting out, if you work hard and play by the rules under our bipartisan tax law, you'll have the incentives to succeed. If you are successful in America, Senator Coates and I are saying to you, good for you. We're going to have a tax system that's going to treat you fairly in the days ahead, and you will be able to continue to be successful. So this is about low rates for everybody and keeping progressivity. Last point that I'd want to make goes to the question of how you approach something like this. And Jim Carter and uh, uh, others who watched for two years saw what the fundamental question was, and it's not much different than what Ronald Reagan and Democrats dealt with in the 80s. And that is you go to individuals, the business community, and others and say, how low does the tax rate need to go in order to have you give up some of these preferences you get today? That's the fundamental question in tax reform. And when Senator Gregg and I started it, continued by Senator Coates, with respect to the corporate rate, which is now the second highest in the world, the business community said, fellas, if you can get it close to the mid-20s, that'll be fine. We are now at 24. We have added repatriation, which it seems to me is a transition to a new system without some of the preferences. And I can tell you this morning that if it was part of an effort to come together and get an agreement, I think Senator Coates and I could get very close to the 20% target on the business rate which solves a lot of problems as it relates to America's position in the global economy. So last uh, and final point, uh, Bill Bradley is the one that I credit with the statement. Once I called him and I was kind of complaining, there's a Yiddish word called kvetching, everything's impossible, can't get anything done in Washington, we'll never make it happen. No matter how optimistic Jim Carter is about this, it still can't happen. And he said, Ron, just remember, Reforming the tax code in America is always totally and completely and thoroughly impossible until 15 minutes before it comes together. I'm not telling you we're at those 15 minutes right now, but we are marching up the hill. The president has clearly demonstrated an interest in it. The deficit commission has demonstrated an interest in it. Congressman Camp, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, has demonstrated an interest in it, and we think the path forward to actually getting it done and making sure that 10 years from now we're not tied to this clunky anti-growth system is to do it in a bipartisan way. That's why I have the good fortune to have a terrific partner, Senator Dan Coates. Senator Wyden, Ron, thank you. Uh, I had the great privilege of inheriting uh, the great deal of hard work and effort that Judd Gregg and Ron Wyden put together with Jim Carter and their efforts and Heritage's input and a number of others that have uh, scrubbed this thing through and worked this thing through and spent countless hours and effort uh, to bring this bill to the position that it was today. Uh, many of you know Judd and I came to Congress together in 1980. We served together in the House and then in the United States Senate. We've been longtime friends. I was on the phone with him for significant amount of time uh, just uh, just yesterday. So uh, the first thing I want to do is basically uh, credit Ron and Judd Gregg for, for a tremendous effort along with the help of Jim Carter who they both say this wouldn't have been possible without his, without his engagement in this uh, in a very, very significant way. 
uh, I have the great privilege of being handed the torch by Judd, basically saying, and accepted by Ron, uh, saying uh, this is something that ought to go forward. There's a growing consensus, uh, if not almost a total consensus, that if we are going to deal with the fiscal plight and crisis that uh, we are on the edge of the cliff on uh, here in the United States, that a growth component, and, uh, and, uh, uh, as articulated uh, and laid out by comprehensive tax reform, has to be an essential part of this effort. Is government too big? Is it growing too fast? Are we spending too much? Absolutely. And that's what our debate and discussion has been for this uh, last several months, if not a couple of, uh, couple of Congresses. Uh, and it seems to be coming to a head in terms of how we need to go forward and deal with it. But there is a consensus, uh, uh, I think virtually total consensus, that unless we have a growth component, we are not going to be able to solve this problem. We cannot just simply cut our way out of the problem that we have, and we can't tax our way out of the problem that we have. We have to have economic growth combined with necessary fiscal discipline uh, as to how we spend the taxpayers' money. Now, I sat here listening to Ron Wyden, and if you'd taken the Ron Wyden name off of this, you'd have thought you were hearing from Jack Kemp, Bill Bradley, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, as he talked about the underlying principles necessary uh, to make this bipartisan effort uh, a, a success and make tax reform a, a, a component of our, of our growth. Um, I think that uh, one of the reasons that I'm excited about this particular bill is that it is built on a foundation. If you don't have a foundation of basic principles uh, on which to then judge everything that you are incorporating into this tax uh, reform, uh, then I think it, it perhaps is doomed to failure. But we start with revenue neutrality. We didn't want to get into a, uh, and we know that it has to be, be, be scored that way on a static basis. But the whole concept of growth is that it creates a dynamic of growth and creates a dynamic of prosperity that increases revenues and actually uh, ends up in a plus. And Heritage has been very helpful in, uh, in helping us uh, understand those numbers. And as Ron said, ultimately it all comes down to growth, prosperity, and jobs for the American people, and growth for the American economy. And so we believe that the uh, provisions in here that, that support growth, and particularly those that affect uh, uh, the business and corporate side of tax reform, are there to create a dynamic that's going to give us some very, very important numbers in terms of achieving that goal. Simplification, I don't know, if, I don't have to go into any details on that. We all know that the 71 plus thousand pages of the current tax code and the 10,000 or so special exemptions, credits, uh, preferences, and so forth uh, have created a nightmare of a tax code for the American people to fill out on every year, but for corporations, and that that has to be dramatically simplified, and we do that in this package. I talked about economic growth. There are protections in here for American families and individuals uh, through the provisions of uh, uh, tripling uh, the standard deduction, uh, eliminating the alternative minimum tax, and a number of things that, that fall in that category. And then fairness. We're looking at broadening the base and making it fair across the board. Uh, so uh, there, these basic principles are are the ones that undergird the decisions that we have made and will be continuing to have to make relative to this. Ron has said, we're open for business. We, there are going to be all kinds of people delving into this package and saying, well, what about this, or this is negative, and so forth. We're asking people to look at the big picture, number one, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. But we are open to hearing pos uh, suggestions, constructive suggestions, if they fit within these basic principles, and we can maintain these basic, this foundation uh, of principle which undergirds this tax reform. So yes, if uh, people say section such and such, uh, subchapter this uh, affects my particular business or whatever, and that's, that's a negative, uh, bring us that information. Let us work through that with you. Let us see with your proposed solution or other proposed solutions can, can uh, stand the test of, of meeting these basic principles, and we're open to talking about that with you. But we think it's very, very important to start this uh, uh, process of getting our fiscal house in order by having a key component of comprehensive tax reform as part of that. 
Ron Wyden, as I said, and Judd Gregg have just done tremendous work on this. I'm privileged to be able to uh, carry that torch going forward. It won't happen without bipartisan support. It won't happen without support from outside entities that basically say it's been 25 years since the last effort to do this. It was done under a bipartisan way, and it's time now to revisit this again, and particularly critical time to revisit this again because of the crisis that we face uh, with our debt and our deficit and the absolute necessary component of comprehensive tax reform being a part of the solution. So with that, uh, I think we'll open it up to the floor. and, and uh, uh, let, let you uh, go forward. Well Thank said. you all very much. We do have some Twitter feed questions that we will insert, as well as those here in the audience. I'll ask one or two of those first, but when we get to the audience, there will be microphones that we would appreciate your using and making uh, at least introduce yourself and an affiliation if you would care to. Uh, we have a Twitter from user mwarner95. I don't know if that might be Senator Mark Warner listening to us, but since, <laughs> since it is addressed from Indiana, I'll modify it. What is the that biggest... Word. What is oh, the Indiana <laughs> word. <laughs> Probably a troublemaker. What, what is the biggest advantage of this plan to the average Indiana family of four and obviously to the average Oregonian family of four? I'll, uh, I'll quote Heritage. Uh, <laughs> typical family of four, according to the Heritage data analysis, will get tax relief of more than $4,000 a year. So this is a bill that helps working class families. And in a consumer-driven economy, that's obviously a clear, uh, a clear measure of, uh, of how this is going to affect a typical American household. Indiana? Well, uh, if you look at this uh, for anyone earning under about $200,000 a year, uh, it, it provides uh, a better, uh, first of all, a much simpler way of filing your, your taxes. But secondly, uh, favorable if you are raising a family, uh, uh, we have retained and uh, incorporated into this uh, favorable standard deduction as well as a child tax credit as well as a dependent uh, tax credit. <coughs> Uh, so by simplifying it and also by bringing a, an element of fairness into this, we are able to, number one, guarantee that rates uh, will not be uh, uh, increased on taxes and that you will find yourself in a much more favorable uh, position in this. I remember, I noted that uh, I think Senator Wyden mentioned 10 years he'd like to see such and such. Uh, is there a rational way that this will get enacted? Or what are the roadblocks and what is the future for getting this done in a timely manner? That, that of course, has been the, been the key question. Whenever you face tax reform, there are scores and scores of interest groups that come forward and say, if you take away my particular tax break, Western civilization, as we know, <laughs> will end by in 48 hours. You know, that's basically the argument. The economy will fall apart. I serve on the Senate Finance Committee, and if you look back at 1986, there's actually been a book written. It's called, like, Showdown at Gucci Gulch or something. <laughs> and what Dan and I feel so strongly about is what you saw in 1986, where a big host of Democrats, people like Bill Bradley and Dick Gephardt, got together with Jim Baker under President uh, Reagan's, you know, leadership and said, we're prepared to stand together against all of those interest groups seeking these narrow preferences in order to make the case for the greater American good. They said, we can lower rates. And Senator Gregg and I talked about this often, and, and we've been having these conversations again. They came to the conclusion in 86, which is still spot on today, that the marginal tax rate is hugely important. The tax rate that you pay on the last dollar of income earned is hugely important. But all these preferences are not, because these preferences end up with narrow interest groups hijacking the taxpayers' you know, revenue in order to benefit themselves, but not do much for the country. So I think if we can make the case, given the fact that since Senator Gregg and I spent all these hours, we have the Deficit Commission. I mean, the Deficit Commission said point blank, Gesundheit in the back. <laughs> the Deficit Commission said point blank, we are modeling our work after the White and Gregg bill. So we have come a long way. We don't underestimate how tough 
this is going to be to get done. But Senator Coates put uh, the mood of the times just right. This has got to be about more than cutting. We've got to focus on growing. And this is something, it's not like health care. I mean, we've done this before. And that's the case we're going to make. And, uh, and with uh, Chairman Camp uh, in the House uh, recently embracing the 86 principles, we've got a lot to work with now. And I would just add something I said before, and that is the, the whole atmosphere today is different. Uh, there is a recognition on the part of, of the community here in Washington, but also across America, that we are in a serious financial uh, situation. And there is an, also an understanding that one of the components necessary to get us out of this, as I said before, is growth and growth that can be achieved through a, a, a comprehensive reform of, of the taxes. So whether it's Paul Ryan or whether it's uh, Ron Wyden, or uh, any of a number of other people that have spoken out about what we need to do today, uh, not two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. Uh, today is different. Uh, this time, what we're facing is historically different than what we have faced before. And so there is a sense of urgency and necessity that is here today among Republicans and Democrats uh, and analysts from different parts of the ideological political spectrum that basically says uh, the faster and better we can do this now, the less pain we're going to suffer in the future. And, and this is all going to come down on us. Uh, we're either going to take rational steps going forward now uh, to uh, uh, alleviate a much more painful situation that will come if we just uh, put this on a track that uh, may or may not happen five or ten years from now. Uh, you may have addressed this to some degree, but the one Twitter user, Steve Wynn, if I'm reading this note transcribed correctly. Steve Wynn from Nevada. <laughs> Maybe. He probably has, will have an interest in But uh, speaking, uh, speaking of Western civilization ending in 48 hours, with the entire country focused on a government shutdown, why tax reform now? Well, I'm going to just start with that. Look, this has been something that's been in the works for two, and two years plus. Um, it all is part of uh, what I just talked about. Uh, you know, that obviously is an issue related to short-term funding uh, for the government uh, for a 2011 budget. But uh, everybody who said, leave no stone and return, uh, unturned, uh, everything must be on the table, has to incorporate the idea of comprehensive tax reform if we're going to have growth, prosperity, and jobs available for the American people uh, as quickly as we can put that in place. We're, we're obviously not trying to take our legislation into the Senate Finance Committee between now and, and Friday. <laughs> but I think it does send a powerful message that on an issue so important to the country's future, it is not all a food fight in the nation's capital. I mean, these kinds of bills are a heavy lift. Jim can tell you there were times over the two-year period when... Senator Gregg and I just said, we're going to chuck it. We can't agree. We can't agree on this and that. Democrats have to have this. Republicans have to have, have that. And we just stayed at it. And Senator Coates and I have had some pretty spirited discussions as well over the last, uh, last few months. But all of us said, let's think about the country's well-being first. I mean, both sides, just as you saw in 1986, take away fundamental principles that they hold dearly, and the country comes out the better for it. So yes, we know that with the focus over the next 48 hours on keeping the uh, government open, you know, tax reform is not going to happen by Monday. But I think we do think that this is a pretty important message to get out right now. We ought to be focusing on growth, and somehow, with the stakes, as Senator Coates has said, so high for the country's ability to compete in these global markets, somehow you've got to cut through the bickering and bring people together. We won't hold you to Monday. We'll expect All it right. Tuesday. Next week. Uh, questions here in the room from anyone? If you'll just raise your hands. We have one at the back. If you'll wait for the microphone. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's Grant Aldonis with Split Rock International and former Undersecretary of Commerce for International Trade. And I kind of look at this uh, from the point of view of our competitiveness globally. And the first thing I want to say to both of you is to applaud the effort uh, to not fall into the trap of thinking it's either about cutting or raising taxes and to recognize it's about growth, ultimately. I, I really want to endorse everything you guys said about that. The second thing, frankly, to look at 
the degree to which the world has changed since 1986 and understand that globalization has altered the way we compete. And there's a lot of things to recommend the bill in terms of how you think about how we're going to compete in a new global economy, both the leading edge of the economy and the trailing edge, how they get back in the game in a lot of respects. That said, there's also provisions that I'm a little bit concerned about because in one sense they suggest that there are tax preferences where none exist. I'm thinking particularly about one in the energy sector that I worry about, which is the dual capacity uh, provision on foreign tax credits. And what I'd like to know is whether that's designed more as a pay for, uh, because the analyses I've seen from guys like Dan Jurgen is that that's not a tax preference. That, in fact, is a situation where the oil companies, which now have to compete against state owned oil giants from Iran and Venezuela and places like that, um, actually currently have less favorable treatment in terms of their foreign tax credits. So it's not a preference, in fact, it's a, a net negative. And I worry about the nomenclature in one sense by leaving that on the preferences list. So I'd like to get a sense from you why that's a part of the package. And again, if, if in one sense you're open for a conversation about that, how we could address uh, the need to fill the revenue gap without doing something that might be fundamentally distorting to the competitiveness of the energy sector. Probably wouldn't surprise you for us to, to hear that we've had several discussions about that <laughs> issue already, but I'm going to let my lead guy here start out, and I'll be happy to make a comment on it, too. Ryan, I, I think the, the energy sector obviously brings front and center this whole debate, and I thought Senator Coates made a couple of very important points, and you'll see that in the changes uh, with respect to intangible drilling, uh, expenses, and LIFO. I think that we were concerned about America's energy independence. Obviously, I, with Senator Bingaman's uh, retirement, you know, now uh, I serve on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Senator Coates does. We're going to be working closely together on energy issues as well. I mean, the, the challenge is really to kind of drill down in, into the essentials. I think overall, and this gives me a chance to maybe segue into this international area, I think we've hit the right mix. Now, Senator Gregg and I spent 18 gazillion, gamillion <laughs> hours on the question of territorial taxation. And I will continue to be open to this, and I think Senator Coates will. I mean, this is part of the you know, ongoing process. The challenge is to make sure you're not doing something that invites more gaming than we've already got. And part of the issue here has been transfer pricing mm -hmm. and the idea of generating a sale in one place and booking a profit in another and all of the tax avoidance schemes associated with it. That's why I brought up, and I haven't really kind of gone much further than this, the idea that if you can keep driving that corporate rate down, you solve a lot of your problems. In other words, we're at 24 now. It took a tremendous amount of work to get there. If you look at our joint committee on taxation analysis, we could probably figure out some ways, working with business and labor and everybody involved, to get that down even further. That solves a lot of your challenges with respect to international taxation for energy and for other important manufacturers, pharmaceuticals, and, and others. So the door is not closed, but you should know that I thought Senator Coates made a very persuasive case on energy. Uh, it's reflected, there are a handful of changes, energy and repatriation, that we think, if anything, make this bill even more growth-oriented and reflect some of the challenges you're describing. Can I just add to that, that it, obviously we've talked a lot about it, uh, I think you raise a very legitimate point. Uh, I've heard from both sides. I've heard from major international corporations say, boy, you give me 24 or around their uh, percent and uh, the opportunity to repatriate back at a, 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 a very low tax rate. Uh, and hey, I don't need all that other stuff. Others have, I think, some legitimate issues associated with that. And I think the key thing here is that both of us agreed we're open to talk to those people. We're open to, to, to work on that. We're not saying that this is a, a stark black-white issue here where we're right and they're wrong or vice versa. So uh, in the end, our goal is to make our corporations and industries whether they're doing business domestically or internationally, competitive with the rest of the world, and that's an issue that we're going to continue to work on. Also at the back. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm just Rick James. I'm, I'm from Utah uh, on Senator Mike Lee's staff. Um, one of the concerns we have is with farms, family farms. Um, it doesn't take much for a family farm to get over the $10 million mark that you have. And we're seeing family farms being sold right and left just to, just to pay the tax bill. Um, from what I've seen in this bill, there's nothing that addresses the family farmer that's had the farm in the, in the family for generations, um, and yet they're, they're not getting any kind of break, and they're losing the farms you know, every, every day we're seeing that go away. Um, I'd love to see them get the GE tax rate that, that GE paid, but is there anything that, that you're looking at to add for the family farmer? First of all, I mean, the, the family farmer is going to get immediate expensing. You know, we have this provision that allows for small business to write off the cost of equipment on day one. That's number one. Number two, a lot of those folks, as you know, pay taxes as individuals rather than, you know, C, C corporations. So if you have the typical farm family of four, and that's why I mentioned the heritage analysis, $4,000 more in their pocket, protect their, uh, the tax break they get for their home and uh, matters uh, like that that are so important to middle class uh, people. We did not touch the estate tax in the debate, which I guess is one of the questions um, you're talking about, because the estate tax isn't an income tax. We deal with income tax you know, reform, obviously because we have a two-year you know, agreement with respect to estate taxes as a result of the action last year. This will come up at some point. But in terms of the basic breaks for the typical small business, I can tell you, and I'll let them speak for themselves, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, which is an organization that has a lot of uh, members from you know, farm country and, and ag, uh, ag country, has talked to us about many of these provisions. I did a press conference with them. Uh, recently, so we have uh, we have been working closely with folks representing both rural communities and uh, uh, the small businesses that uh, are so important to their well-being. But the death tax that I'm referring to is that going to be addressed? Uh, obviously, you're going to have to address it at the end of the two years. But we are we are silent on that issue, and because we were writing an income tax, you know, reform bill, and the estate tax is not you know, an income tax. We dealt only with income tax, you know, issues. I understand it will come up. I happen to be particularly sympathetic to the point you're making. What I'd like to do the next time it comes up is really depart from current law and have a small business tax rollover. In other words, you would say the next time this comes up for a small <coughs> farm like you're talking about in Utah or in Oregon where we have many of them, if the parent dies and the child takes over the farm and it remains as a farm entity, I would basically like to have the tax man cometh only in a very gentle way. Now, if the kid decides to retire and go off and play golf in Palm Springs, then it's a different you know, matter and they ought to have to pay some taxes. But uh, tell Senator Lee, who I had breakfast with uh, uh, a week or two ago, I would be very interested in working with him on this whole question of how we approach uh, the ag, uh, ag sector, and particularly the idea of next time having some sort of small business tax rollover for those folks. I'll go back to the other. I think not questioning certainly Heritage's $4,000 figure, but the Twitter questions seem to be getting to adding this up. For example, does your plan cut taxes? Is it revenue neutral? Does it increase spending? They're, they're trying to get a handle apparently on how does all of this add up to well, what we look, need to? Well, you can look into this and find areas where uh, there are adjustments to tax rates for specific things. But when you look at this at the whole, it is a tax-neutral, uh, 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 revenue-neutral plan, and we intend to keep it that way. Um, so it, it's easy to look at one particular thing and say, well, you know, the tax rate currently on this is this and so forth. But you have to look at the whole picture in terms of what we've done to make this, make this, uh, make this revenue neutral. But uh, clearly, uh, for those uh, individuals, families, and so forth that fall into the middle of middle category and even low income category, uh, this is a uh, uh, there are tax advantages in tax breaks and lower taxes that are going to be paid. 
for people who fall in those categories. And I, I'd only urge listeners to go to our websites. I've got it up uh, uh, already, both the Joint Committee on Taxation Analysis and the Heritage Analysis make it clear this is a revenue-neutral bill, and because of the benefits of growth-oriented tax changes, you get folks like Heritage saying you're going to increase revenue to the government, not because you went out and raised uh, taxes on some particular group, but because you generated more growth in our country and more revenue flowed as a result of it. Questions here in the room? Here. And then if there's some on that side. Uh, Terry Campo, ex Grassley Council. Uh, and Senator Wyden, this is really directly follows the point you just made. I'm just wondering if there's, I know you have to use uh, static analysis for the budgetary scoring, but has there been any re estimate of what the actual revenue increase would be from the tax simplification you're proposing? Heritage. Heritage has made an estimate, the 60 some 61 billion 61. a year. Interestingly, it's exactly the same number that Republicans are trying to gain. <laughs> I don't think there was any coincidence uh, or, or any conspiracy to uh, come up with that particular number. You think we cooked the books? <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is, I, I describe this because we're following this in the negotiations for the long term. This is the have your cake and eat it too opportunity, you know, because there's long been this debate about static and dynamic, you know, scoring. And I find myself, as usual, being kind of a cantankerous independent between both groups. The government will always score in a static, you know, way. In other words, if you take away some of the breaks, as we do in certain areas, in order to hold down, you know, rates for the broader, you know, group, you can call that static scoring. You know, you take it over here and put it over there. But we do think that there is a dynamic feature to, to, to this, and that's reflected in the fact that when you make growth-oriented tax you know, changes, you put more people to work, as we saw in 1986, and that means more revenue flows uh, into government's coffers. So this may not be technically right to call it the have your cake and eat it too approach to scoring, but to some extent you do get some of the thinking from both sides. Uh, just to add something to that, there was an editorial piece in the Wall Street Journal a day or two ago by uh, George Schultz, uh, uh, Becker, and uh, John Taylor out of Stanford, who basically, and, and the, one of the key points of that particular, uh, and their particular analysis was, even without factoring in the dynamic growth, the fact that if you can assure uh, that rates will not increase in the future, there is a dynamic to that because that, is a, that has a huge psychological effect on, on mm -hmm. the financial markets and people who are in the investment business and trying to figure out what the best way to do with their money. If they have assurance going forward that, the, that they know what the rate is and it's going to stay at that rate. So even without that other dynamic that Ron was talking about, I believe, and they believed, and they've done some good analysis on it, that there is a dynamic just from coming forward with an assurance that two years from now or one year from now, the rate is not going to, marginal rate is not going to be increased. We have time for a couple of more. One back here. I'd like to see you face to face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm General McKnight. I was in the Pentagon in 86, uh, second Reagan term. I was director of command and control systems. We had the Goldwater Nichols Act came along, and it was supposed to reform the armed forces and make it more growth oriented instead of having the military industrial complex with pylons of interest only in Navy or Air Force or so forth and so on. I haven't heard Goldwater Nichols mentioned very much in the last 10 years and it seems that the military industrial complex has gotten even more complex. Uh, an example is the Boeing uh, tanker. It just took forever to get those kinds of things going. And I think that uh, there's plenty of growth can be made even with a reduction in the numbers of people in the military, but the efficiencies come in the R&D and in funding things that do stimulate growth. And I'd like to see you take a look at the Goldwater Nichols Act again and see if there's not some things there that would make the armed forces better. I know that it's cooperation with the State Department should be much better, but it isn't. The, uh, the uh, Armed Forces has their quadrannual review. I think the state is just now coming together with that. But there's a lot of savings could be made 
by cooperation between the State Department, things like USAID, and Homeland Security. There's a lot of savings could be made and a lot of stimulation and growth. You're our expert. Well, <laughs> I was on that committee uh, for 10 years. Um, I think it would be a mistake not to incorporate uh, defense uh, uh, initiatives into our debate about how we deal with our fiscal issue. Uh, uh, Secretary Gates has uh, made some proposals along that line. No one is talking about degrading in, to, uh, uh, in any way uh, the capabilities of our armed forces. But like any major organization, any large bureaucracy, which the Pentagon is, uh, uh, there are efficiencies that can be gained. And I think that's the subject that the Congress is going to be dealing with as we're looking at uh, how to uh, uh, really do more uh, with less uh, spending. And so I appreciate you bringing that to, to our attention. It doesn't exactly fit into what we're trying to do here with the income tax reform, but uh, as I said early on, all these things are related together. And I'm a proponent of a leave no stone unturned as we look at how we can make government more efficient, efficient for less cost. Well, I got hammered on all of the thousand dollar toilet seats and those kind of things in those days and roasted over interoperability problems in Grenada. So yes. Do we have one last question from the floor since we're tight on time? Here at the back, if you'll wait for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, if I could bring the discussion down to uh, to politics, I guess it's a question for Senator Coates. <laughs> no, not, not politics. <laughs> oh no, a question for Senator Coates though, because this is this is the week we're seeing um, a a Republican budget that includes tax reform. It includes um, you know rate reductions at lower rates than than are that than appear in this bill. Uh, corporate tax rates and cuts that are different. Um, how do you sell this to uh, members of your party who? Look at the the, the, picture, the fiscal picture of the country and say, to grow we need, you know, 10 points lower. Uh, the marginal tax rate that should be at 25 percent, not not 35. That should be the highest, and everything else in there. I mean, this package is higher, has higher taxes than what uh, House Republicans proposing and a lot of Senate Republicans agree with. Well, I mean, that's a component uh, uh, that has been put into it, but I think uh, even uh, uh, Paul Ryan and others have basically said, look, these are, uh, this is the starting point. We're putting out a plan uh, that incorporates a number of features in terms of particularly how to deal with mandatory spending going forward and, and uh, discretionary spending along with it and some other forms. And, and uh, they have acknowledged that, you know, this is, th we want to start the debate <coughs> on how we go forward, uh, not only with the 2012 uh, uh, budget, but what the implications are for future years out. We want to be part of that debate. Um, I, I think they would look favorably at sitting down working with us to try to achieve it. As long as we are on the same page in terms of the, the basic principles on which undergird what we're trying to do here and looking for the best ways to achieve that. Uh, uh, the other thing I would say to my, my Republican colleagues is, is that unless we get bipartisan support in putting all this together, uh, we're not going to achieve it. And here's a bipartisan effort that that uh, two people have worked on uh, that are very skilled in this area, Judd Gregg and, and Ron Wyden. And I'm happy to uh, be the one to uh, uh, carry on for Judd, which is not an easy job, by the way. Um, uh, and something that has been, uh, that ought to be part of the mix, that ought to be part of the discussion on how we best can get from here to there. So, um, uh, as our caucuses, I don't let Ron speak for himself, our caucuses have been opened to saying, uh, uh, let's get together. And you know the, this, this group of six that's working together. Let's get together. We had Simpson Bowles and so forth. Let's to get together on tax reform. Uh, it happened in 1986. Um, it happened in 1983 with the Social Security changes. It, 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 it happened uh, under Bill, uh, President uh, Reagan, a Republican president. It happened under Bill Clinton with welfare reform. You can't get these major changes incorporated and support from the general public unless you can write, take it above politics. And we're trying to take this above politics and base this on principles, not on politics. Dave, let me just follow Senator Coates, who I think has given you a really thoughtful assessment of how he would take this to a group of Republicans. It is almost a mirror of what I would face 
when I go to talk to some Democrats. I mean, I can see some Democrats <laughs> saying, uh, excuse me, Ron, you're talking about taking the corporate rate lower than Chairman Camp has actually, you know, proposed? I mean, I can see some people staring at me, you know, pretty coldly. What I'm then going to describe, much as Senator Coates has said, is all the discussions I've had with labor folks and business folks about how this is something that can work for everybody. I mean, we say that we're going to get those lower rates for American business so we can create red, white, and blue jobs by taking away some of the tax breaks that right now incent the uh, business activity offshore. Those are tough calls, but they're calls, I think, that bring people together. I think we can have, around the key judgments we're uh, making here, we can have a business labor coalition that builds on some of the principles that we saw in 1986. Mm -hmm. The alternative, folks, to, to, to this is just continuing the same stale, polarized, non-action program we've had year after year after year. This is the first bipartisan tax reform bill in 25 years because nobody has been willing to get through the last kind of question. Is Republicans go off in their area and say, we've got to have it all our way. Democrats go off into their area and say, we've got to have it all uh, our way. What we've tried to do over what amounts to a three-year period is see if we can cut through that, bring people together in a way that's going to make this country stronger and fairer and particularly more competitive in these tough global markets. Thanks for asking it because I think that kind of sums up the challenge. And join with me now in then thanking our two senators. And thank you for joining us.